Some of these maps, I think these maps will be somewhat familiar to you in that you probably have something of a similar image in your own mind about how um, Buffalo, uh, the, the, the geography of Buffalo and the racial geography of Buffalo. But if you just look at these maps, it couldn't be sort of starker. Um, the big separation we have straight down the middle of our, of our city. This map here has the percentage of African Americans living in neighborhoods, and neighborhoods are squares on this map. Um, and you can see the darker color is where more African Americans live. Over here, um, there's a percentage of white. And you can see that it's a very much a mirror image uh, where African Americans are living in large numbers, whites are living in almost no numbers. Um, some of those percentages they have on here give you a good, good sense of this. Um, these neighborhoods have 2.4% white, 4.2% um, uh, you know, white, very, very low percentages. The likelihood of running into a white resident for this, these neighborhoods is very low. By contrast, these side, 92% black, 93% black um, in most of, most of the neighborhoods. And you can also see on this um, map, this, this line here that is on both maps, that's Main Street. And I think most of us know that Main Street kind of divides the city into two on racial lines. There are, other, there are other lines in here, too. Uh, one uh, is a little bit harder to see in, because it crosses through a neighborhood down here, South Park Avenue, um, which divides the, um, uh, the sort of lower, the southernmost end of the east side from the all-white um, uh, First Ward, uh, for example, and then this in, in South Buffalo here, which has a large, large percentages of white, white folks. The other big color line, of course, is the boundary of the city itself. Very few African Americans live in the suburbs, and from this point on, more or less, the percentage of white just go up to, into the 100%, uh, 90%, 100% for miles and miles until you get to Rochester. Okay, so that's, that's more or less um, the, one of the phenomena that we're going to talk about is why separate. But it's also clear from this third map that things are also unequal. It's not just about being separate, it's about being unequal as well. And one way you can find that out, and incidentally, all three of these maps are available for free at uh, City Hall. You can just go down to the Office of Strategic Planning. Um, they came up with this amazing map that shows every single parcel of land in the city and what is on that land, if there is anything on that land. And um, in their wisdom, they decided that single-family houses, two-family houses, and three-family houses that are all occupied would come in these sort of peach colors, peach and brown, light brown colors and they would make uh, vacant lots in black. Well, it so does happen, though, that the, the places where intact housing, um, fully occupied housing, predominates is in an area I, I call, and we could call it the white wedge here. This is edge where, this, this wedge down the middle of the city that is all, um, that is largely white. Um, and so the same thing happens on this, on this map. You can see the sort of uh, various different light brown colors. And then, and that the um, vacant lots, where obviously clearly money has not been invested at all, where, where money is not coming into these neighborhoods, it's very clear, uh, because the houses are, have uh, disappeared over the last uh, 40, 50 years, uh, one by one, to the point where we're in a situation where we have a, a city that's about one quarter in ruins or empty. Um, so, uh, what, the big question I want to ask is why? Why separate? Why unequal? Um, and so I'm going to go and answer that question by looking at Buffalo for sure, but before we get there, uh, world history more in general. So why separate and unequal sections of cities? Um, is this just a case of things being de facto, this is the way it is? Is this informal, that is something that um, uh, just sort of kind of happened on its own? Uh, was it something that people wanted, voluntary? Uh, do, do birds of feather always flock together? In other words, is this just a situation of people wanting to be um, together? Um, in other words, if you, if, you answer, if you answer the question using these, these terms, um, then you get to a sense, a sense that segregation is more or less an innocent phenomenon, okay? something that just uh, happens and it's just there and it's just sort of an innocent thing. Um, there's no, no social injustices behind it. Um, and I particularly don't like the word de facto because it doesn't actually explain anything. It just says it just is de facto. It is a fact, right? So my answer, of course, is no. This is uh, not uh, an innocent phenomenon. This is a uh, this is a social injustice. And so this is in the series on social justice. Um, we're going to be talking about um, the, the injustices 
bottom. There is a there's are there are institutionalized forms of racism at work in this in this uh, process of dividing cities. They have been and they still are at work in both the separation and the inequality. Okay, um, and then on top of that. We need to know to understand this best is that segregation is also a phenomenon with a very long global history that um, is being manifested here in Buffalo, um, and that within that global history, American segregation stands out in certain ways that I want to talk about. Um, first of all, the institutions that are at work. Okay, let's. If I say institutional racism, we can say that all the time. Usually it means it's very, very vague. What I have in mind are very, very specific kinds of institutions. Governments, um, international networks of intellectuals and reformers. Okay, this takes a little bit more thinking, but basically you know, any intellectual and any urban reformer have contacts all across the world, and they pass ideas back and forth. And segregation is one of those ideas that has been passed back and forth, and it's one of the reasons we have it in Buffalo. Um, and then finally, the global real estate industry. So there are three very specific, very huge, very powerful institutions at work, sometimes more than one more than the other uh, in different times, but they're all uh, at work. Okay. Now, to, um, to answer, to put this in the context now, we're going to have to go way, way back in time, okay? Because um, the idea of taking a city and dividing it in two to control it better, to make it more unequal, is as old as cities themselves. We're going to go way back in time. We're going to go back to the city of Eridu, which is often considered the very first city in human uh, history, uh, 5,000 BC, 70 centuries ago. Um, and it was originally founded um, as a place where the, uh, the god, the Mesopotamian god, this is in, this is in uh, Mesopotamia or Sumer, southern Iraq today, um, where uh, the, the, the god said, I want a temple to myself. I want people watching over that temple, and I want it to be separate from where the mortals live. Okay, so in some sense, uh, the very beginnings of cities, this is all in, cloaked in legend, of course, um, were uh, from the very beginning segregated, and the idea of it was to to, keep, to um, increase the power of um, local officials, local authorities. In this case, somebody who styled himself a god um, and a king um, from ordinary. So that's the ziggurat, and the ziggurat itself is a form of segregation, not racial segregation, but segregation between gods and mortals. It goes way, way, way back. Um, if we bring it a little bit, uh, quite a bit forward, we're, we're going to zoom ahead now um, nearly 60 centuries, um, we come to uh, Venice. And um, since ancient times, another way that cities were divided were between people who would consider themselves local and foreigners. And those foreigners could be merchants from far away, usually that's what they were, people who came from far distances. They would be put in separate parts of the city um, because they feared for their lives sometimes, um, because the king wanted to keep them aside so that he could uh, use them as a scapegoat at any given time. And over the years, that, uh, that, that particular form of segregation between strangers and locals uh, varied a lot. And one way in which it came into being, um, and very importantly, was the creation of Jewish ghettos in European cities during the Middle Ages. And the most important, the most famous of these was in Venice, where the word ghetto was invented. 1516, they said all Jews must live in this tiny little island in the middle of a big city. Those of you who visited Venice know the, the Grand Canal. It's up here in the north um, and uh, northwest part of the city. And all Jews had to live there. Um, there was a canal around it, there was a boat paid for by the Jews to, that made sure that no Jews would, would go, go out during the night. And uh, only the doctors were allowed to go and, you know, and take care of patients um, during the night if they, they were sick. So that's where this idea of the stranger's quarters uh, became, became the ghetto. So that's an important thing because we use that word ghetto today in America to describe segregated zones. So that's another place we need to go. Um, but as, now that's, that's not, neither, none of those are racial segregation per se. Okay? The word race hadn't been invented in 1516, it just was being invented for the first time, it was used for things completely differently. Um, to really understand the segregation by race and um, color, um, we need to come to it's about 1700. And um, this map here just shows uh, 
we don't need to spend a lot of time. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to another number of times. But it shows the, the various different ways in which racial segregation spread from one place in the world to the other. Okay, and there are there are four big movements, big, big spreading points across the world. And that's what my book is about. Is about those four big movements and spreading points when uh, racial segregation went from one city to many cities. Um, to begin, though, we need to go to a completely different place, a place you might not have, um, have thought of as, as the birthplace of anything, um, is southern India, in the city of Madras. So we're going we're to zoom in now to the city of Madras, which is located right here on the map. Okay? And we're going to look carefully at what is there. This is a map from 1700 that shows the very first place that a divided city was, the, was officially designated by two separate um, places, two separate towns, a white town and a black town. Okay? Seven to ten they decided to so see. If you look on the map, you can see, if you look very carefully, the white town, and up here is the, the black town. Okay? Uh, the black town is obviously bigger. It's where uh, the Indians and other Asians lived in this in the city. The whites, um, who were the British East India Company, which was a company of traders and merchants, set themselves up inside this fort uh, with very high walls, with cannons pointed on the black town, um, and this is where all the rules of the city were, were made. So you can see again, a little bit of the ziggurat is still there, it's a separate part of town um, where the rulers have um, their, their spot. Uh, they're, they're ruling over the rest of the town, and it's a very unequal situation in terms of power. Okay? Um, still not race, because blacks and whites were not considered races in 1700 yet. It took until the late part of the 18th century, the 1700s, for that to happen. And the place where that really got going is another city in India, which was the capital of the British Empire in, um, in, in Asia. And that is Calcutta. So we're going to make a quick jump over to Calcutta, just to the north. And here you see a much bigger city, um, and also one divided by race by this thing called Esplanade. Here are these, these um, sort of less dense areas up here were compounds for white people. In other words, the, 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 the English, British uh, uh, colonial officials in this city lived in walled areas, a little bit like our gated communities today, um, off in this part of the town. And the rest of the town, as you can see, was very, very different texture. It was much more um, medieval alleys, um, lots of houses where the Indian elite lived next to um, all of their, um, their followers. Um, and so, very big, big contrast. Now, there wasn't as big of a, of a dividing line here in Calcutta, and that was because the city was, was founded in a place where the Indian, um, local Indian officials were much stronger and they didn't want this division. So, um, they had to make do with a little bit less of a, a line. However, this is the first place where those three institutions that I started off with began working. Okay, the modern versions of them. A government was in charge. There were lots of reformers, urban reformers, and uh, especially medical people who were interested in, who believed that, that um, Indians caused disease for white people, that white people could catch Indian diseases, and so that Indians had to be kept at a distance from whites. And there were also uh, the first urban real estate, global urban real estate industry was getting going here. People would transfer money back and forth from London to Calcutta and uh, invest in the real estate market here. And it was very important to them that they keep the property values up. And so this is a part where that starts to come into the, into the picture as well. Um, OK, so that's the, those are sort of the two birthplaces, in the, if you way, of first color segregation and then race segregation. Um, the, the first big uh, um, surge across the world was across India itself. And the British founded 175 segregated cities uh, across India. These are just a few of them. Um, and uh, the idea was that they would, they would have places for Indian officials, or British officials to go and rule the vast subcontinent of India and all of its many millions of people um, by, by setting up these little sort of encampments, segregated encampments near the big cities. They also decided that um, India was too hot for them. And they were very worried that they were going to, that the British were actually going to expire when they were in India, that they would, they would start to degenerate uh, actually biologically degenerate because of the heat. And so they, they came up with an idea, which is to go up into the mountains. And they found the mountains was a lot cooler. It reminded them a little bit of Britain. 
there was fog up there, there was cool breezes, and so on and so forth. And they could build their little Indian, uh, their little uh, British cities. And you can see a nice little British cathedral here, a bunch of British mansions around here on the top of the mountain. Um, below this, down below, you got some uh, the, the, the place where all the Indian servants who would work in these um, in these mansions would live. They would live in the lower bazaars, as they're called. And they, this was a serious business because some of these mansions had over a thousand servants in them. Okay. Serious, serious amounts of servants. Most of them were in the hundreds, uh, but thousand was not completely off the off the kind of the viceroy of India had two thousand. So. Um, Lots of servants are needed for every single um, every single British uh, ruler. Um, okay, and so the, this temperate race thought it could survive there. And during the Indian summers, the entire government would leave Calcutta, which was considered a, a pestilential vapor <coughs> bath, one of, the, one of the officials, and they would go up to a cooler area of Simla, and they would for, for eight months they would rule, rule from there. They had two separate capitals. Um, <coughs> Now, if we go back, to, if we keep on going and follow the, uh, the, the spread of the segregation from India outward, um, it's the second surge, and that that, one, that, that surge goes from uh, from India towards China. Um, and the, once once the British conquered India, they were got very interested in, in trying to do the same in China and get because China is even richer than India. And um, so they, but but the Chinese government didn't want any foreigners in, so they had to break in basically. And segregated cities help them break into China, in a sense. The first way you, you do that from India is that you, um, that you set up a place um, in Singapore. Now, Singapore is right on the, on the on a choke point for the tra trade routes. And so a guy named Sir Thomas Raffles, a British guy from Calcutta, went down there and founded himself a segregated city. And he planned it as a segregated city from the very, very get-go. If you look at this map, you can see here's the European town. He said, this is the way we're going to set it up. We're going to have a European town, we're going to have a garden, we're going to have a um, place for the soldiers that we're going to have, and we're going to have a government house. And then over here, we're going to have the Chinese inhabitants of Singapore and the Indian inhabitants of Singapore who are going to be bring, helping um, bring goods in from, from China and India, respectively. And then they're going to put the um, Arabs, uh, or the Muslims, as, as the local Muslims, over here in this, in this corner of the town. So they have them all separated out. And the idea partly was that each of these groups had a different system of laws. They were gonna let those laws go intact, but they didn't want people to bump into each other and make and cause problems, because then which law would, would apply, you see. So that was kind of a bit of what was going on. It was, it was about a government imperative more than anything. But uh, once you got Singapore in place, the British could start to move into the East China Sea more regularly not have to deal with the Dutch as much who were in charge there. And eventually they, they just barnstormed into China. Um, I'm not going to get into the whole story of how they used opium to, to get into the Chinese market. We may, we may know a little bit about that. But one of the, one of the um, after effects of that was that they took over the island of Hong Kong, which is just outside uh, the port of Canton, the most important port of Canton. And there, too, they began to set up a separate place. By the 1890s, they set up a, a separate place way up on top of the mountain there. And, and the, you know, Hong Kong is a mountainous island. It's basically a bunch of mountains that stick out of the East of South China Sea. And um, so the idea was, let's go all the way up to the top of the mountain, and then we won't be pestered by um, Chinese people. And so they had, this, they had this system up there. The other thing that was going on here is that Chinese residents of, of Hong Kong are extremely rich, like many of the residents of other Asian colonial cities. And they could buy up uh, real estate very quickly. So um, it was very hard for the whites to separate themselves, because if they set up, set up a separate district, that would attract Chinese um, landlords. And those, they, could buy, they could buy houses in the white zone. So eventually, they made a deal with a, the with a Chinese elite that they would get the top, the very barren top of these mountains, where after all, they said, you know, we can pretend to be this, just like in the hill station, we can be in a cooler place. Hong Kong is very hot, as you know. And then the Chinese can get um, land anywhere else. So we'll make, a, we'll make a trade. And that that worked out. So it became the first sort of kind of real estate refuge as well. So we get that third, um, that third uh, institution involved here as well. OK, so that's that. And then, then we get, uh, that's, that's the second surge out into China, into the Pacific. Uh, I didn't talk too much about the Pacific, but let's, let's get to it in just a second here. The third surge, because it overlaps with this third surge, is the biggest of all. It's called, I call it segregation mania in the book. And that's because um, this is a time when segregation became kind of the rage in, in, among 
all kinds of planners all across the world. And the main reason it became a rage was because the plague broke out in Hong Kong in 1894. When it broke out, people started to blame, this is a classic thing that's already been set in place, that uh, the re reformers, urban reformers, doctors, medical people, public health officials, started to blame Asians, Chinese in the first place, then later on in Bombay, Indians, um, for uh, transmitting the plague to white people. And they said, okay, we've got to separate these people out. And this is the first time we use the word segregation uh, as a, a way to divide a city. Um, so that happened, in, it started in Hong Kong, but it quickly spread everywhere, wherever the plague went. And the plague spread rapidly along the sea routes all across the, the world, uh, to Africa, across the Pacific, uh, into, into the Americas. And um, let's just follow one, uh, one of these transfers to, to Honolulu. Here in Honolulu, um, there was a Chinatown, an area where Chinese immigrants had, had settled for, for a long way back. Chinese, Chinatown was blamed for the plague arriving in Honolulu, and the public officials burned Chinatown down to stop the plague. Okay, so what you see in the background are the flames of Chinatown, and we see in the front foreground are, are various residents of Chinatown coming running out as this, as this fire, which they set as a kind of testing, uh, they set it as a kind of test see whether they get rid of a couple of buildings. But there are these winds on Oahu at this time of year, and they came racing down, and they quickly, quickly incinerated all of Chinatown. This is in 1900. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. And this is, again, the racial theory of the plague, and these are the reformers, again, who are talking about this. And they're talking to each other all across Africa, all across the world this time about this thing, and, and, and suggesting that fire is a good way to take care of the plague. Um, if we go all the way across to the other end of the segregation mania to West Africa, we can find similar kinds of things going on, sometimes about the plague, but even more now about malaria. Uh, West Africa is, is home, as you know, to some of the most um, deadly mosquitoes in the world, the, the Anopheles mosquito. These things can reproduce in a tiny little puddle that's left behind by a hoof print of a cow. So these things are amazingly able to, to uh, propagate malaria. And once again, even though they knew by this point that malaria was, was passed on by mosquitoes, they blamed Africans. And not only blamed Africans, but they blamed African children. Because African children uh, got sicker, seemed to be getting sicker than the adults, because after all, once you, by the time you're an adult, um, you have more um, you have more immunity, and so they didn't seem too sick. So they said, what we have to do is keep the Europeans away from African children. So they, this, this one map here, for example, has uh, pictures where there are lots of African children. It's hard to read from, from the screen, but this is the area where there are lots of African children. So they proposed the site for the European residents to be a separate place. This is uh, Freetown in Sierra Leone. Um, similarly, uh, in Nigeria, there's a whole areas where there was building free zones between the European zone here, these building free zones, and the African zone over here. To keep them, they, they had to be like 400 yards, they said, apart because that's how long, that's how far a mosquito could fly. So if the mosquitoes couldn't fly from the black zone to the white zone, then you were supposedly safe from malaria. Of course, it was complete nonsense. Um, white people still got malaria, even though they lived in segregation zones. It has nothing to do with whether they're getting black people or not. Beforehand, right? It's, it's, it's crazy, but this is this is this is uh, the theories of mosquito, uh, mosquito transmission were pretty uh, were, were just filtered through the yeah, racist ideas. Okay, so that that's another uh, place where you saw the sort of disease area segregation mania. Now, let's go now back to a, go to another map, and this is a, to talk about the fourth surge. The fourth surge I call arch segregationism. I'll get to why I call it arch. Arch means bigger segregation, more powerful kinds of segregation. And there are two real societies, uh, two societies where that uh, was, was most important. I'm sure you can name them right away. The first one is South Africa, um, where urban segregation started in the middle of this segregation mania, where they burned cities, and burned black parts of cities, the same way as they did in Honolulu um, in 1904, 1905. Um, and all the way to 1948. And then in 1948, they renamed this whole system of apartheid. Okay, which I think you've heard of before. Um, I'm going to talk just briefly about that, but you can see this map here of Johannesburg, which is the biggest city in South Africa. And uh, what happened by 1970, all the neighborhoods in the northern part were solid white, except for one little one called Alexandra, which still exists today. And then all Africans um, were, had been moved to Soweto. All people of mixed race were moved to this one part thing, and all Indians were moved to this 
city. So they, they had almost complete and total segregation. There were just a few neighborhoods in here that don't appear so well on the map that were a little bit what they call gray areas where a few um, liberal whites had, had, um, had allowed Africans to uh, rent flight park property and so on and so forth. But otherwise, it was pretty much right down the middle. And furthermore, there was a 15-mile zone between here and here. So this is a buffer zone, a massive buffer zone of just open prairie, um, plenty of armed vehicles is also, also patrolling that, that area as well. Um, the mines are in there, the gold mines that have these huge mountains of um, mine waste in between them. So they, they made this enormous buffer zone in between the two uh, cities. There were the past laws, there were all these other things that went on as a part of this um, very, very vicious system of, of segregation that uh, lasted from 1948 to 1994 when Nelson Mandela um, uh, won the presidency, actually, they started to start the fourth uh, presidency. So anyway, we get a little sense of that. Um, interestingly, there are some many features of this that are actually present in American segregation as well, and that's what I want to focus on, I want to talk about a little bit as we go along. So let's let's jump to the United States now that we've gone across the world. Um, it's it's now is the time, <coughs> 1900. Now is the time that American cities began to divide by race uh, during this era of segregation mania as well. Okay. The story there is a little different, but still there are institutions involved. Um, you know, all three of these, you know, all three of these institutions are involved in one way or another. How that worked out is a little bit different, and that's that's sort of where I want to head as we, uh, as we come back to Buffalo. Okay, so let's fly all the way over to Chicago. Um, this is what we know of uh, as our segregation system um, in uh, the United States where there are inner city, uh, not, not extra city like in Soweto, inner city areas um, in the middle of the city known as ghettos or as black neighborhoods, segregated areas. Um, and uh, the suburbs, the outside of the cities are nearly, you know, in the, in the 90 to 100 percent white. There's, there's a little bit, little bit of change in recent years, but not that much. Even the suburbs in you know, our cities are segregated, as you can see by some of the Chicago suburbs, all black here and white in between, um, and so on. So, uh, huge amounts of, of, of uh, segregation, but in a slightly different pattern than in South Africa, geographically. Um, let's see, what do we got next? Okay, so let's look at the similarities between these two parts, <coughs> South African and U.S. segregation, first of all. Um, first of all, they, I call them arch segregation because they, both systems were able to outlive the mid, the mid 20th century. And the mid 20th century was a period when all across the world, anti-imperial movements were being successful at throwing, overthrowing empires, where we had the civil rights movement in the United States that was taking energy from those anti-imperial movements and that was overthrowing Jim Crow and other forms of segregation in, uh, in, in the United States. But both of these systems outlived that era. The systems in Calcutta and Singapore and all those other places did not outlive this, this era. But ones in the United States and South Africa did. That's why one reason why I call them our segregation. Both of them involved extreme amounts of racial hatred and violence. Actually, the US system involved more violence than South Africa, more mob violence than South Africa. Um, and both harnessed the lie that black people bring down property values. And this, this lie, I'm going to talk about it and why it's a lie in just a couple of seconds, but it's, it's an important part of both systems, okay? And it's very important for understanding how these things continue. Um, let's talk about some differences, though, before we get into that. Um, in South Africa, the segregation laws, so laws that said blacks will live here, whites will live there, were constitutional. The South African system allowed for a allowed for race to be used, discrimination, racial discrimination. There's no problem with that under the South African Constitution. And so they passed two big laws, 1923 and 1948, that divided the cities. Um, one's called the Urban Areas Act, the other called the Group Areas Act. And these things basically said, here's where everybody will live. And, they, and you saw the map in before, and that's what happened. Um, because the government was, so, was able to be so powerful in this way, um, there was less need for the other two institutions, the reform networks, and the real estate industry. They were both involved, but they didn't need to be as powerful. In the US, in 1917, the Supreme Court just said that segregation laws like this are unconstitutional, okay? It was a, the, the decision is Buchanan versus Worley, 1917. It was a great victory for the very young NAACP. The NAACP said, 
here's a law in Baltimore that says there can be black, block, black blocks and white blocks. We think it's unconstitutional. They took it to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, which is a very white supremacist organization at that time, had passed Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, a few years earlier, said, no, we can't do residential segregation by law. Okay, we can't have laws that, that uh, divide our city. So that was, a, that was a big victory for the NAACP, a big defeat for the white segregationists of the time. Because they wanted to pass this all across the, the country, and they had been very successful. Baltimore, uh, St. Louis, New Orleans, Atlanta, they had all of them passed these laws. Um, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, which was actually the law that was brought down by this, this system. Even Chicago was thinking about it right before Buchanan versus Florida. Okay? So we could have had it here in Buffalo, very likely. Um, if, if it had gone through, but it didn't. So that's a big, big moment. That means that you need, since the government is a little bit more, just because just there's a law, you can't pass a law, doesn't mean government can't be involved. But it does mean that these two other uh, institutions, reform networks and real estate industries, are more important in the United States. Okay, let's talk about that. Come up. And then finally, um, two, some other, one other kind of difference. In South Africa, who could talk racist talk anywhere you wanted to, in Parliament, in uh, official publications, in the law itself. It didn't matter. You could go ahead and discriminate the way you wanted, right? And you could say it, and you could make justifications for it on the basis of all kinds of racist rhetoric. And they, believe me, they had plenty of racist rhetoric. They just went, along, went away and belted it out on the rooftops, right? In the U.S., things needed to be different. After Buchanan versus Worley, you couldn't say those things. You had to be quieter about it. You had to disguise segregation and discrimination. You had to put it in a kind of camouflage, okay? And that's what we're going to be talking about now, how we created a camouflage system of segregation in the United States that looks like it's just voluntary. And this is where we get to it. We get back to the beginning of what I was talking about. It looks like it's just there, de facto. But in fact, it's being put together, and people are, are actively using it, doing it. So let's hide down here in the, in the fine print, okay, in some sense. How do you hide this segregation? How do you hide something that looks so obvious as these maps, right? How do you hide that in some way or another? Keep it a little bit uh, like it's, it's somehow okay. Well, first of all, you can pass racial non-laws <laughs> that are enforced by government, okay? And one of those would be the restrictive covenants and deeds. Those are not laws, but they do forbid black people from living and buying a white house, a yeah. house in a white neighborhood. They're not laws, and they are, in fact, held up by government because the courts are the, are the guarantor of a restrictive covenant. If you have a restrictive covenant in your deed and you sell a black person, uh, sell the house to a black person you're not supposed to, the neighbors could sue you, and, uh, and you would have to, you'd have to null that contract. Okay? Currently? Not now. No, no not anymore. <laughs> See, it's still, oh, I'll show you. It's until 1948. Okay. Okay. Not anymore. Um, those still exist in many people's deeds, especially in the suburbs of Buffalo, and I'll show you in a few in a minute. Um, but you cannot, that, that's a, that's a non-law, a, a racial, it's racial, but it's a non-law, okay? Or you can do non-racial laws that are implemented in racially in unjust way. Um, zoning is one of those kinds of laws we use for racial, uh, I'll show you how to do that in a minute. The FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, did this as well. The Urban Renewal and Public Housing all involved non-racial laws that were implemented in race, racial way. And finally, there are other institutions that can jump in too, real estate agents. Real estate agents can, um, can steer people from, to various different neighborhoods. So we have uh, yet another very, very powerful institution, it's not government, but the, the um, professional organization of, racial, of, of real estate agents can tell them, tell their members that they can't, um, they can't break the code. So that's another way of doing it. And then you can also do it, racial practices that are pro by professionals that are also quietly endorsed by the third institution, government. And the FHA involves redlining, um, and then later on, reverse redlining, which I'll talk about towards the end. Okay, so these are a bunch of different practices that you can use. Let me just, let's go now um, <clears throat> to, um, to Chicago, and then we'll jump back to Buffalo, okay? So just to give you a little sense of, sense of the historical context of how this was put in place. First of all, um, the, the guys who did this, uh, there are real guys, there are real people who decided that this is how we're going to make segregation, are... Um, are people from a reform tradition and people from a real estate tradition. On the reform side, we have Richard Ely, who was one of the most, um, he, would, he would be the most famous economist of his day. He was a popular guy, very, very widely read. 
and he believed um, that um, that real estate should be um, uh, organized along racial lines. He had an ally in the, in the, in the very important um, National Association of Real Estate Boards, which is now the National Association of Realtors. The uh, head counsel of that was a guy named Nathan William Chesney, very, very powerful guy. Um, both of these institutions, the Institute of Land Economics and the NER, were located in Chicago, and the two of them got together and they worked out a lot of the pieces of this plan that I was just telling you about in the 1920s, and then later on they brought it to the government in the 1930s. So what are they working with? Well, first of all, they're working with the bearded lie. The idea that, um, as this article says, Negro tenants lower values, records show. In fact, if you look at this, what happens is, uh, black people move into a neighborhood, um, no, nothing, nothing changes. If anything, the real estate values go up because black people have to buy at higher prices because they have left less options, okay? Um, but if white people move out of there fast, then property values go down. So it's, it's white people's action to move out that brings the property values down. Why? Because then there's less demand for those houses, right, uh, overall. So that's, that's the lie, but this is the lie that they were working with as a fundamental scientific truth, okay? Both Ely and McChesney were working with that lie. Also, they were dealing with the fact that there was lots of violence. Every time a black person would move into a white neighborhood, white neighbors would oftentimes band together to try to kick them out. And it wouldn't be just band banding together. It would be oftentimes sitting out in front of this house, 24 hours, chanting, yelling uh, racial epithets, throwing things at the house, getting guns out, uh, and eventually finding people who were willing to set off bombs of these houses. And there were incident after incident after incident, not just in Chicago, all across the country, especially during World War I and then afterwards, and then World War II and afterwards. Uh, we had something similar here in Buffalo, not nearly as much, but there certainly was stuff. Um, so this is what they were dealing with. And then, even worse, in 1919, this kind of violence got out of hand. Uh, the great Chicago race riot of 1919, the great, I mean, the horrible Chicago race riot. White folks got into this, the cars, came racing through the black wow. neighborhoods, started shooting from the cars, wow. throwing bombs. Uh, 36 people killed, um, most of them African American during this, this time. Here's a picture of some, a white mob kind of racing after, um, trying to find some black people living in a white neighborhood to throw some bricks at them. Okay? Terrible thing. And who is looking at this but these guys that I just told you about, these real estate guys and this uh, reform guy? And they're saying, you know, this is not going to work. We're not going to be able to segregate. We want to segregate the city, but we can't do it this way. Because Chicago has now become this, like, got this huge black eye across the entire world, so to speak. Um, this, this, you know, Chicago is looking really bad, okay? We've got to figure out some way. We're the elites. We've got to figure out some way of dealing with this issue. And so this is what they put into place, and they started exporting it across the country, including to um, Buffalo. First of all, restrictive covenants. I mentioned it before. Um, this is the restrictive covenant from Seneca park development in West Seneca, um, and this was based on a template that, uh, that was written by Nathan William McChesney in Chicago. It says basically, said premises shall not be uh, occupied by, by persons other than those of the Caucasian race. Okay? So you can't sell this house, you can't have it occupied by people um, who are other than the Caucasian race. Um, that kind of thing spread everywhere. And uh, this one I found in the, um, just across the way here in the, in the vaults of the Erie County, um, uh, sat the, 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 uh, the, 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 the county, the county executive building. Um, you can find those things in there. You can look around, especially in the suburbs, in, in, uh, where whole developments were set up with these restrictive covenants in mind. Okay, so that's one way you can do things, as I said. Um, Racial steering. Uh, this code of ethics was written also by William, uh, William uh, Nathan William McChesney, 1923. And uh, Article 34 of this, uh, this just lines out all the things you have to do to be a professional real estate agent, not to be a dodgy guy, but to be someone who really is uh, super professional. And Article 34 says, a realtor should never be instrumental in introducing to a neighborhood uh, members of a race or nationality whose presence will be clearly detrimental to property values. Wow. Okay? So they said that to be a professional real estate owner, you had to steer people. Okay? And that, of course, that, that um, is, is now illegal, but it continues. We, it's one of the single most reasons for, most important reasons for segregation today, is racial steering. Um, it's very hard to stop, uh, but uh, the, a, a big commission on civil rights that was actually led by Jack Kemp, uh, 
Republican Jack Kemp, found that about four million acts of racial steering occur across the United States every single year. Um, so that's, that's an important thing that goes on. Um, so now we're talking about the 1920s, 1930s, so all this stuff continues through. By the 1920s and 30s, we're starting to say, um, a lot of people are starting to say, well, what's going on is, yeah, black neighborhoods are getting a little segregated, but it's no different from Italian neighbors and Polish neighborhoods. But just briefly, I want to show you these maps that come from the Grover Room right across the way of Buffalo during the 1930s that show where Polish people live, where, where black people live, and where Italian people live. And you can see some concentrations. Um, I'll have a, this map, you can look at it more carefully later on. You can see some concentrations where Poles live on the east side, uh, Italians on the west side, and then this much more clear concentration of African Americans living in right next to this neighborhood right here, basically right where the library is and, and just a little further east. What? These are 1930s, 1933. So um, the, the big difference between these, these, these two maps and this map is that in these maps, Italians also live everywhere else in the city. Poles live everywhere else in the city. Okay, they're they're welcome everywhere else in the city. Also, those those big blotch, blotches where there are more poles and Italians also contain other people as well. So they're living together voluntarily, maybe, but they're also inviting other people in. Okay, for African Americans, they're not invited to anywhere else other than people's neighborhoods. Um, they live in a very very concentrated thing. The only uh, spread is up Main Street, which is the beginning of the Black East Side. This is the 1930s uh, when the, the the black side that we know today is really a creation of the 1960s, when lots of African Americans moved to the city. And this time it's relatively small. But um, there's a little neighborhood up here which is important, and that's where middle class African Americans are starting to move. So called middle class, most of them are actually sort of really working class, they're Pullman porters and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, ministers, teachers, to some degree. They're living up in, in the area right on Del Delvin Avenue. Okay? So that uh, is to say that this is voluntary is a bit of a myth. There are, some, there are some ways in which people come together voluntarily that don't necessarily exclude people when they do that. With African Americans, they are excluded. Okay, so that's what's going on. Um, and then this, this is how the government got back into this business uh, really strong. Uh, this is the, um, the so-called redlining map. In 1934, the Federal Housing Administration started to put tons of money back into um, mortgages across the country because people had been losing their houses in the Great Depression. But they also decided that they were going to put this money, they also had to decide where they were going to put this money. And what they decided is they are going to only put it in, in neighborhoods that they considered solid. Um, and so they began to decide where the solid neighborhoods were and where the unsolvent ones are. And the red ones were going to be places where they weren't going to lend very much at all. Okay? And so you can see exactly where that red, where these red neighborhoods were. Some of them are poor white neighborhoods, but uh, all the African American neighborhoods are, are there. And look. That neighborhood of middle class African Americans is also zoned red. Okay? So this is, there's clearly a kind of a racial discrimination going on here. And the text of the, of the, um, of the manual that was involved in deciding where this money would go says explicitly you don't put it in black neighborhoods or transitional neighborhoods. neighborhoods wow. It says explicitly that. Even though the law for the Federal Housing Administration is non-racial, they were implementing it in racial ways. So this is what redlining, uh, where redlining got. It also uh, spon helped sponsor white flight to the suburbs because most of that money that they were going to give out actually went to the suburbs. Okay? Um, here are, here's a report from Buffalo from this time that says, here's where we're going to put the money in and where we're not going to put it in. We went neighborhood to neighborhood. They got local real estate officials, uh, a lot of very prominent names that we continue to have today, to go through the neighborhoods and say, where, where should we put the money, where should we not? This is what they came up with. They said, is there, is there shifting or infiltration? This says colored infiltration. Yeah, there's some slow colored infiltration. That meant that you downgrade the neighborhood. Uh, so other descriptions and so on, you can look at later if you want. They also discriminate against Jews to some degree. Um, you see infiltration of low Jewish type. Low Jewish in this area. So there was, there, there, was, there was some nationality discrimination along with this as well. Um, and again, this is Bernie Becker and Bourne. It's all the, all, the, all the big names that we have today. Then there's urban renewal, yet another non-racial program that was implemented in racial ways. Uh, we wanted to get rid of uh, uh, blighted areas, but they chose the blighted areas that were closest to downtown. Almost all, all of them were African American neighborhoods as the primary places where they would destroy neighborhoods. This, in some sense, would be involved what was called Negro removal because they would take most of the black neighborhoods, raise them to the ground, 
where Elm Street and Oak Street used to be all black neighborhood. They were put, they were run through here to make traffic come through easier, but it also created a buffer between uh, the east side and downtown, so downtown businesses could uh, feel more comfortable about having their white patrons come in and so on and so forth. Um, that happened in cities across the country, that there was kind of a kind of zone between downtown and the, the black neighborhood. In a sense, they were doing what they did in South Africa here with their force removals and focus on that. Not all. Not all people who were removed were black, but large numbers of black and then Latino, and a few, only a few white. So that's another place to go. Look. Um, segregated public housing, this is something that the library has worked a lot on. Um, it's a big issue. Uh, public housing in itself is not a racial program unless you build public housing for black people in black neighborhoods and public housing for white people in white neighborhoods, and that's what we did in this country. Uh, overall, in one half from city after another, after another, after another. It's a whole, whole big story that you can hear a lot about here in the library. Um, these are some of the some of the ways in which that, that happened. I'm not going to get into it too, too much. Um, if we bring it up to today, so that I can I can finish up. We're, we're going on for a while, and we'll answer your questions. Um, today, we, we continue to have redlining. It's illegal from 1968 on, but we continue to have it. It's uh, the, all, every single study shows that uh, African Americans are much less likely to be qualified qualified for mortgages. Uh, or more often pay higher interest rates, so on and so forth. This tremendous cost yeah. being, being black uh, in, this, in this society. Yeah. And if you look at where the money is going in terms of mortgage investment, this is, a, this is Erie County. You can see that according to recent data, um, it's all in some of the dark areas where the money are going. And if you look in downtown Buffalo, uh, you right. see the east side completely white, almost completely blanched of, of investment. That's why, of course, vacant houses are, are vacant lots and so on and so on are proliferating as in that map. It's because we're not funding, we're not, we're not, banks are not putting money into those, into those neighborhoods. That continues to, to exist today. There's also a, another effect, which is the reverse red line, that there are banks that are putting money into those neighborhoods, but they're doing it in, in the form of these predatory loans that are uh, very likely, very difficult to pay back. If you, if you get one and you're poor, it may look good on the surface, or relatively modest needs, it may look uh, good on the surface, and then Suddenly, the uh, uh, the adjustable rate clause fixes in, and you're you're paying three times the interest rate you were paying the month before. Your payment goes from 300 a month or 500 a month to 1,500, 2,500, and you can't pay unless you have, that was the source of all the, the foreclosures. Um, and also, um, <clears throat> the uh, the global economic crisis of 2008 that we're still in the midst of, and that uh, those things um, those things were also disproportionately. They, they, what would happen is the banks would actually use the redlining maps almost as a way to uh, decide where to put those, where to push those predatory loans. They often did so in fraudulent ways, and so African Americans um, overall uh, disproportionately affected by these, these things as well. So that's what we call reverse redlining, uh, giving terrible mortgages into places where we haven't given good mortgages for a long, long time. So that's where segregation is. A little bit today, it explains a lot of that. The, the black uh, on that on that final map there of the vacant lots uh, that we have, um, and it explains the fact that if you go to the east side today, you see a city reverting more or less to the to the prairies that was originally built upon. Um, huge areas. This just gives a tiny little bit of a gigantic vacant lot in the, in the Broadway Fillmore area, looking out towards where we are right now. Um, <coughs> lastly, and just really quickly. Oh, okay, so a few things like this. Uh, there's actually a lot of similarities with the, with the South African case. Um, but what's interesting, if we go to the differences piece, South Africa claimed that it could, it could, it could um, provide white people with permanent racial zones. The US never got that far, it could never do that. On the other hand, if you look at it in a bigger, broader perspective, the use of legislation actually made South Africa's apartheid more vulnerable politically. And in 1994, it was discontinued, right? In the U.S., it's still chugging along, very fine, thank you. And uh, in, in a sense, the camouflage is what made that happen. Uh, if, you, if we had a law, we would have all kinds of constitutional. It would be a sitting duck, right? It would be a, in fact, that's what restrictive governments fell in 1948 because they were kind of a sitting duck. There were there were obvious racial discrimination. And here, we don't have obvious racial discrimination. It's all camouflage, and in some ways, that makes it, the whole system stronger. Um, so that's what the peculiar, peculiarity of the U.S. form is, and it's what is what makes it so difficult. It doesn't mean that people haven't tried to do something about it. 
Uh, in fact, in the 1960s, there was an open housing movement here in Buffalo. Here you see people saying we're not, we're, they're, they're protesting against urban renewal, they're protesting against, um, they're protesting against the segregated public housing. Um, uh, and they got pretty far. They got the passage of the 1968 Fair Housing Act and so on and so forth, uh, a law that has been since very languished. Uh, the enforcement has not been very good, uh, but we still have it. Um, 